chosen theme, by way of exhortation, my beloved brothers and sisters, comes under the simple title of the courageous spirit. I'm going to, for a few moments, consider Stephen in the context of the courageous spirit and as we bring our thoughts ultimately to the focal point of our meeting together this afternoon as we remember our Lord in the way appointed. So then, just come back with me please to Deuteronomy and chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31 Remember then the words that Moses spoke to the people. Verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go before thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of a good courage. And, and as you follow those verses through, Bram sisters, particularly in, in Deuteronomy and Joshua, everybody is telling everybody else to be strong and of a good courage. God tells Moses to be strong and of a good courage. Moses tells Joshua to be strong and of a good courage. Later on, Joshua tells the people to be strong and of a good courage. Later on, the people tell Joshua to be strong and of a good courage. They're all telling everybody else to be strong and of a good courage. It was that encouragement that was necessary. Come across again to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. And we're going in at verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according unto all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper. Margin, that thou mayest do wisely, whithersoever thou goest. So what makes us courageous, brothers and sisters? Is it just nice sentiments? What makes us strong? What makes us of a good courage? Well, the next verse tells us, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but shalt, thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We won't look at it, but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it talks about Lois and Eunice, Timothy's parent and grandparent. And that's what the word there means, success. It was that family member that, caused him to have that success and so for us brothers and sisters to be strong and of a good courage to be courageous it's not about broadening our shoulders or flexing our muscles it's not about that at all what makes us strong is that quiet Meditation, thinking, waiting, understanding, trusting in God. That's what will make us strong, not going in our own strength, not at all. Myself and Alison were privileged to spend three and a half years preaching abroad. And there was this brother, he's fallen asleep in the Lord now, Brother Phillips. David will remember him, Brother Richard Phillips. And for many years, when I would see him from time to time, I would say, how are you, Brother, Brother Richard? His answer was always the same. Just quiet. Just quiet. 
I, I confess, brothers and sisters, there were certain times where it, fa- it made me feel a little irritated. <laughs> a little frustrated. How are you, brother, brother Richard? I just quiet. I just quiet. And then, do you know, one, one day, come across to Isaiah chapter 30, please. Because in, in, in Isaiah chapter 30, it all came together. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall, be, shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. I just quiet. It's not, is it, brothers and sisters, about relying on our own strength. Feeling that we can bear the burden, the sh- shoulder it. It's not that at all. God will take that burden. All we have to do is to wait on him. He will make us strong in quietness and in confidence. That's where our strength lays, brothers and sisters. And and how is your strength now, sister? In the problems and worries and concerns? I don't know. The failing of health, what might become of the children or the grandchildren, and how is your quietness and confidence, brother, with the challenges of the home, the challenges within the ecclesia, the things that people might say in that ultra-critical way? Or the letters that one might receive. And it causes us to break down, to shut down. And we know in our hearts that ultimately the thing that will make us strong is that quietness. Has that brother Richard, I'm just quiet. And what he was really saying to me, and I didn't realize until years after he'd, he'd fallen asleep, what, what he was really saying to me is, Brother Kitson, I'm just quiet and waiting for the things of God, that God will work things out for me. Maybe that's the thing to bear in mind. And so we move on now to Stephen. Brother Nathan, and this has been resonating in my thoughts to the early hours of the morning. Brother Nathan said, and he picked it up yesterday, I remember, how the veil of the, the temple was, was rent in twain, remember. And, and now notice this, it says, from the top to the bottom. Now we know it's saying that man had no, there was, there was no, nothing to do with man, was it? Not through man's intervention. Man would rip it from the bottom to the top. It doesn't say that, does it? It's from the top to the bottom. And as it were, the, 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 the curtain, the stage, as it were, has opened. And then you have Acts of the Apostles opening up, building up to a, to a wonderful crescendo where Stephen sees the glory of God. And it's enacted, as it were. So let's step by step look and see these lessons for the word of exhortation, Acts please, and chapter chapter 6. So they are chosen. Seven men are chosen and the complaint was the disciples haven't got time to serve tables, daily ministration, or in the original, attendance or relief service. The Grecians are saying that their widows are not being looked after. 
and the disciples say, well, look, we haven't got time to do it. You choose seven men. Verse, end of verse 2. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables or serve food or money tables, the word implies there. We haven't got time to that for that. And then it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit. I've got a question. Why did they say seven? Has this happened before? Have twelve chosen seven to distribute, to help those things, those people that were in need. Now keep walking Acts chapter, chapter 6 and go back please to the book of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 31. Very quickly, 2 Chronicles chapter 31. The people have collected so much in abundance for the work of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 31 verse 6. They've collected heaps, heaps of stuff, and laid them by heaps. There's so much. There's so much in store left over in verse 10. Verse 11, then Hezekiah commanded the, to prepare chambers or storehouses for the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. They put 12 in charge, 12 of them, choose 7 of them, verse 15, 14 and 15, to distribute, to give. End of verse 15, se, uh, verse 15, and next him was Eden and Minimim and Jeshua and Jeshemiah and Amariah and Shechaniah in the cities of the priests to their, in their set office to give to their brethren by courses as well to the great as to the small. And so on and so forth. So is it then that the disciples recognize this similarity between 12, the seven given that responsibility to administer. And then the stage is set. Now notice here, Stephen, he was chosen as a servant. To serve, brothers and sisters. He was chosen to serve. He was chosen to administer what was necessary, whether it be financially, to help the, the widows, the poor, or materially. And then we're told in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and others with him. And they're blessed. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now in verse 9, these are the elite. The elite. Doctors of the law. So, for instance, the Libertines, they had the Libertine, the synagogue of the Libertines, they were free men. And they gave their whole lives to, to deep study of the scriptures. And the three things that they held on to were these the law, the land, and the temple. Those three things were right at the center of their whole existence. So therefore, they would dispute with Stephen, verse 9, verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, bribed men, to tell lies. Verse 12, they stirred up the people. How, did, how would Stephen cope with that adversity? Well, brethren and sisters, in quietness and confidence would be his strength. 
and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And the law. The temple and the law. As far as they were concerned, Stephen was undermining all that they had come to understand and, 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 and take to heart. Well, the, the Mosaic law was given to highlight one's inadequacies and one's sin, one's failings and shortcomings. By the time you come to the New Testament, brothers and sisters, well, the scribes and the Pharisees, they'd turned it upside down, hadn't they? Well, we are keeping the law. We are good people. We're keeping the law. We'll pat ourselves on the back. We'll give ourselves 10 out of 10. We must be righteous people because we keep the law. The law was designed for them to show, to highlight their sinfulness, their inadequacies, brothers and sisters. And they had turned the whole thing upside down. We keep the law, therefore we are righteous people. And so when Jesus goes into the home of, 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 of Simon, he says in his heart, doesn't he? If this man were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman it is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And what does Jesus say? Simon? I have somewhat to say unto thee. Master, say on. Seest thou this woman? He couldn't even bring himself to look at her. Se seest thou this woman? And then Jesus highlights to Simon. He is so far removed from the things of God. So far removed. Verse 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. His face is shining, brothers and sisters. His face is shining. The angel that descended, his, his countenance was like lightning. He begins with the glory of God. There is no chapter division. Verse 1, then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. The land between the two rivers, Mesopotamia. And verse after verse after verse after verse, Stephen is reminding them of their own history. And he's saying, God's plan and purpose Ever before we got into the land, God appeared to people outside of the land. It's not about the temple, not at all. He's saying the God of glory appeared in Mesopotamia. Verse 4, and he removed him in, and then came into this land. And he didn't have, verse 5, not even to anywhere to set his foot. Verse 6, and God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn. In a strange land. You see, he's saying God's plan and purpose was outside the land. Ever before they got there. And they were there 400 years. Verse 7. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. They will come back. They will come back. You see, brothers and sisters, what Stephen was reminding them is that ultimately it wasn't about the temple worship. It was about dwelling with God in their hearts, in their minds. To remind them that ultimately they were all hypocrites. Why? Because they looked to the temple they looked to things which were on a transient level that was the point brothers and sisters wasn't it for Stephen he would remind them that ultimately they had to look at their hearts and their minds 
And as the verses continue, it shows us verse after verse after verse. What was important was that they ought to have had God at the center of their lives, trusting him, serving him. Verse, verse 48, how be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Keep a marker in Acts chapter 7 and go back please to Isaiah chapter 66. And verse 1, the heaven is the throne and the earth is my footstool. Verse 2, for all those things hath mine hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. The temple will be destroyed. God will dwell with those who have a contrite heart. That was the thing that they would, needed to be born in mind, brothers and sisters. Verse 51. Stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Verse 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Spirit, looking up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. He starts with the glory of God. And he ends with the glory of God. He sees, brethren and sisters, he says the God of glory appeared. The previous chapter says his face shone. And what does he see? He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It may well be, brothers and sisters, that at Stephen's death, Jesus stood perhaps in recognition, in acknowledgement. Perhaps there's something else. Perhaps Stephen saw a vision of the the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps that would encourage him and spur him on. Jesus says, doesn't he, in the gospel, that you will see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. Was it then that Stephen was able, was, was blessed with seeing that vision of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ centuries later? Perhaps. Perhaps. And as he stands, seeing the death of Stephen, recognizing in Stephen himself, perhaps he sees a faithful, courageous man. But he sees something far greater than that. It's as if Stephen now is echoing, mimicking, as it were, being the, the sort of understudy, the understudy in that stage, on that stage, the one who follows the words, and, and, if, and if perchance he has to slot in for the person because that lead role is no longer available. It's as if Stephen is acting like the Lord Jesus. Just remind ourselves back a page in chapter 6, verse 13, the same accusations given to Stephen, just like the master. They set up false witnesses. Verse 13, and again, he spoke blasphemy of this holy place, that he would destroy this temple in, in three days, remember. And then towards the end of chapter 7, verse 57. And 58. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. 
And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was the courage of the man, Bram sisters. And as we are on that stage of life, as it were, aligning ourselves rather like the understudy, listening, hanging on every word, taking it in, trying to live it in our own individual lives. And how are we doing? And so, as it were, the curtain closes on that chapter. And it's as if the Lord Jesus Christ stands in respect at the death of Stephen, standing up as a sort of encore, as it were, in absolute praise and thankfulness that this man has given everything for his Lord and he stands in respect. Perhaps. Stephen means crown. It's the Greek word corona, from where we get the English word coronation. And so Peter, Stephen, in that day, given the crown of righteousness that will not fade, my last reference, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's as if the Apostle Paul, brethren and sisters, sees his life not necessarily as the lead man but also was a supported man. Verse 9, For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. My margin says, you may have it in your verse, my margin for the Greek spectacle is theater. He sees his life and the life of the disciples and the Bremen sisters as a life in the theater, as it were, and they're the onlookers. God looking on, them trying to set the example that they might be seen as men and women of God. And as we break bread now and drink wine, brothers and sisters, we are so thankful for the one who gave to the uttermost that we also as it were might be dare I say it his understudies to look to him to learn his words to be able to quote what he quoted and did you notice what Stephen says you know it well when Jesus is on the cross. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he quotes Psalm 31. Stephen quotes Psalm 31 too. Jesus doesn't finish the quote. The second part of the quote is, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And yes, it is nice to think that Jesus may say that. Or did say that upon the resurrection morning. It's as if he has learnt the language. The terminology. The phrase. The speech. Of the one who has gone before. Who has taken the lead. And he has learnt it. And come to understand it. And come to live it. So that ultimately. He might do the same. In this theatre, being looked on by God. Pray God that with all our trials and 
tribulations, brothers and sisters, all our temptations, we might be quiet and trust in him and rely on his strength. Pray God we will have the understanding and the patience and the care to do so. Amen.